Hello, this is Brother Denny. Welcome to Charity Ministries. Our desire is that your life would be blessed and changed by this message. This message is not copyrighted and is not to be bought or sold. You are welcome to make copies for your friends and neighbors. If you would like additional messages, please go to our website for a complete listing at www.charityministries.org. If you would like a catalog of other sermons, please call 1-800-227-7902 or write to Charity Ministries, 400 West Main Street, Suite 1, Ephra, PA, 17522. These messages are offered to all without charge by the free will offerings of God's people. A special thank you to all who support this ministry. Amen. That is a secure place, isn't it? For the Christian, the child of God. Hallelujah. Like if we could sing another song as a prayer unto God. O Heavenly Father and merciful Lord, we come to you now in one mind and accord. We are so undeserving to make this request. By your sweet spirit, Lord, let us be blessed. Open the windows and pour out a blessing. Can we sing that together? O Heavenly Father and merciful Lord, we come to you now in one mind and one accord. We are so undeserving to make this request by your sweet spirit. Lord, let us be blessed. Open the windows and pour out a blessing. Shower your power upon us, we We cannot contain it. Lord, open the windows of heaven today. So often we witness thy power so strong, but yesterday's blessings are all past and gone. Once again we stand needy, as humbly we pray. And that's why we lift up our voices to say, Pour out a blessing, shower your power upon us, we pray. Send such a blessing, we cannot contain it, Lord, open the way. Let's pray together. Yes, Father, we've lifted up our voices in a song of request and prayer that you would look upon us, Father, and open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, Father. Lord, yesterday's blessings, oh, how we thank you for them. But Lord, they're past and they're gone and it's a new day, Father, and we need new 
blessings, Lord, and new provisions, Father. So here we are, Lord, and we stand needy before you, God. Oh, Lord, come and minister by your Spirit to every one of our hearts, Lord. Father, every needy, every needy heart here this morning, God. Oh, Lord, as you look down upon us, God, do not pass one of us by. From the very back of the building to the very front, Lord, down in the basement, over in that sick bed, listening by the telephone. Oh God, open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, Father. And Lord, we pray that you would bless your servant this morning with utterance, God. For Father, except you anoint your word by your Spirit, Lord. All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. So Father, we stand needy before you. And we ask, Father, that you would walk in the midst of the congregation today. Walk in the midst, Lord, of the church at Charity Christian Fellowship, Lord. Have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You can open your Bibles to the book of James this morning. God bless each one of you. Thank you for coming our way today. And you'll be blessed as we look into the Word of God this morning. I've been preaching through the book of James, but it has taken quite a while. The Lord has allowed us some other pathways at times, and we praise God for that. But as I was praying about what to share today, I just felt it was time to pick up again in the book of James, and we'll see how far the Lord takes us today as we look into His Word. I want to begin in chapter 4 and verse 13. So we'll read verse 13 through 17 of James chapter 4. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes the way. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, and all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The book of James is a strong letter. As I look at the book of James in the scriptures, it reminds me of strong meat. It reminds me of going on to perfection unto maturing and to maturity. We want to look at these verses 
And I want to focus for a theme of these verses from verse 15. If the Lord will. You know, God has a will for your life. God has a plan for your life. Do you believe that? We're not here by accident. We're not in this building this morning by accident. You weren't born as an accident or a mistake. You know, sometimes people say, well, this child wasn't planned. This was an accident. But oh no, there's no accidents. There's no mistakes with God. You're here for a purpose. And God has a will for your life. And my life. God has a plan for each of us personally. How do I look upon the will of God? Do I look at it as a blessing and something that I want to discover and pursue after with all of my heart? Or do I look at the will of God as like bitter medicine and I have to take it? Do I fear the will of God? Do I fear to surrender my life to Him? Do I trust Him that God is love and that His thoughts toward me are for my good? Do I trust my Father in heaven and therefore I can say, Yes, Lord, to Thy will and to Thy way. Yes, Lord. You know, I have to confess this morning, there was a time in my life that I was afraid of God and His will for my life. I was afraid to totally let go of the reins of my life. Do you know what I mean? You know, it's like I want to be in the driver's seat. Yes, Lord, I want you, I want you to guide my life, but let me have a hold of the steering wheel. Can anybody identify to that? Praise God. But you know, that's pretty hard. It's not a real full, satisfied, overflowing life of blessing because we find ourselves wrestling with God and God's will and our fears and we're not able to just surrender all and let go and give it to God. You know, as we understand that God's will and God's purpose for our life is the best, it's the most fulfilling It's the most rewarding. Then we can trust Him and we can let go of the reins and we can let go of the steering wheel. But you know, sometimes we go through life and we have to have a couple of scrapes along the way and maybe a couple of wrecks until we finally wake up and realize, I can't do it. You know what I mean? And we, we, we come, God, God in His love, brother uh, Paul, God in His love allows us to fail. And gets us in the corner to where finally we say, I'm finished, Lord. I give you my life. I give you my all. I surrender my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In these verses, we see 
three different attitudes regarding the will of God. There's those who make their plans, ignoring God's will and God's plans. You know, we go about and make our plans as if we got everything under control. And we go ahead and we say, well, tomorrow I'm going to go to such a city and I'm going to continue there a year. I'm going to buy, I'm going to sell, I'm going to make a lot of money in today's language. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to go there, we're going to invest in some properties or in some goods and we're going to open up a retail business and we're going to sell and we're going to make lots of money. And we make our plans without consulting or including God in the plans and asking God what His will is. We don't consider the complexities of life. We don't consider what if things don't turn out the way I planned? What if instead of getting gain, there's going to be loss? You know, when we make plans for a whole year, Proverbs 27, 1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Now, is it wrong to plan and to look at to, as to how you ought to order your life and your business? No, I don't think it's wrong at all. In fact, we're very unwise if we don't plan. But these men, they forgot to seek the faith of God and God's will and just went about making their own plans. Reminds me of what Jesus said concerning this certain rich man whose fruit was increasing and his ground brought forth plentiful and he said, what shall I do with all my stuff, all of my goods? I'm going to tear down my barns and I'm going to build greater barns and I'm going to lay up a good supply for years to come. And I'll say to my soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, enjoy life. But God said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then whose shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself. You know, for himself. He lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. These men didn't consider in making their plans that life it's but a vapor. It's just like a little puff of steam. And then it vanishes into thin air. You know, life for us seems a long time. We measure it in years. But God says, Behold, my days are as in handbreadth. Mine age is as nothing before thee, says the psalmist in Psalm 39. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Psalm 102, he says, My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. Job says in Job 9, 25, he says, Now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away. Psalmist said some very pertinent words to us. He said, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts 
and unto wisdom. You know, we may make plans. We may expect to get gain. and to buy, and to sell. But my dear brothers and sisters, if today was the day, God should take your life away. What would happen to your soul You know, we're just one breath away. From death. That's that's amazing. When we think of how frail and fragile life is. And how suddenly death comes. It's foolish, it's dangerous to try to ignore the will of God and just live our own lives and make our plans. We see also in these verses, You know, there's those who know the will of God, but they choose to disobey it. Why? Why would we choose to disobey God's will? Isn't it pride? Isn't it stubbornness? You know, pride, I can do it my way. My way will be better. And it's an illusion. It's a lie. My way will not be better. God's way is the best way. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Disobedience is sin. Disobedience to the will of the Lord. My way is sin. We go astray when we go my way. Jesus said these words. He said, That servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. He knew his Lord's will, but he didn't prepare himself. He didn't listen. He didn't obey. Neither did according to his will. He shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required and to whom men have committed much of him will they ask the more oh but then there's those who obey the Lord's will And they receive the blessing. James 4.15 For that you ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If the Lord will, then I will, by His grace, do this or that. God 
is at the head of all my plans. If the Lord wills, that's what I will. Not my will, but the Lord's will be done. Not my glory, not my name, but the Lord's glory. My life is for Him. You know, God wants you to be filled with the knowledge of His will. He says that right in Colossians 1.9. In Colossians 1.9, Paul saying there to the church there, he says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This is the will of the Lord, that we would be filled with the knowledge of His will, have a clear and a deep understanding, a clear picture, clearly discerning what God's will is for our lives. In all wisdom, and that in all wisdom is into having a comprehensive insight into the ways and the purposes of God for our lives. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And when I think of spiritual understanding, I believe that's the meaning of spiritual discernment. Being able to discern spiritually and discern rightly spiritual things. It's God's will for us that we be filled with the knowledge of His will. In Ephesians 5, he says it this way, very similar. He says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, in verse 17, or verse 15 through 17, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. God wants you to know what His will is. But how do we discover God's will for our lives? In Romans 12, very familiar verses, God says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, to discern and to understand the will of God, we need to present ourselves, our bodies to God. We need to give up ourselves to God. You know, while I was trying to discern the will of God, yet trying to steer the car, that's pretty confusing. You can't discern the will of God rightly because you're not willing to let go and trust God that His will for my life It's going to be a blessing. It's for my good. But rather, you're trying to hold on and yet trying to discern the will of God. We can't see clearly. We can't discern it rightly. But when we give ourselves to God a living sacrifice and we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, then we can begin to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, God's will, it's good. It's acceptable. It's right. You know, we can accept it. We can receive it. And it is perfect. You know, one of the first questions we have to really get face to face with is do I really want the will of God for my life? That sounds like a very elementary question, but it's very crucial and very key 
to understanding the will of God and to proving it in our lives. Really, deep down from the heart, do I want my will or am I surrendered to God and His will? Am I trying to do the will of God halfway or like it says in Ephesians 6, he says, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. You know, it's a heart issue. Doing the will of God from the heart. I think one of the simple keys to proving the will of God and to gaining deeper insight and understanding to God's will is to obey what we already know and what He has already shown us. But if I want to go around this one area and say, well, Lord, I don't quite... That's not very agreeable to me or not acceptable to me. And we try to go on to other parts of God's will. Guess what happens? We just sort of stalemate right there. Until we're at the place where we surrender and we accept God's will for our lives in that area. If the Lord will, then we shall do this. We shall live and do this or that. God didn't promise us that His will would never lead us into suffering or that He would never lead us into Disappointments, losses, afflictions, trials. But He did promise us that He will go with us. Yea, I will be with thee. I will go with thee, even unto the end of the world. God's will for my life and for your life. It's good. It's acceptable. It's right. You can trust your Heavenly Father. You know, sometimes I think we sort of look at this whole matter as if it's optional. You know? I can... Pick and choose. Well, I can tell you, that kind of a life is not going to be very fulfilling. You will not be able to prove God's grace and God's provision and seeing God answer prayers and God opening doors and meeting your needs. If the Lord will, then I trust there's a resounding yes from your heart. If the Lord wills, then I will, by God's grace. What the Lord wills for my life that's what I want. You know, verse 17 of James 4 here is a strong verse. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And that verse has been applied in many different areas of the Christian life. But I'd like to apply that in the context of what it is written here. That if we know the will of God, 
And we know what God's will is for our lives. And I'm not saying every detail of should I buy this or do that or eat this or drink that or, you know, I'm not talking about that. But what I'm talking about is if in the area of your life of surrender and commitment to God and you're holding on to some of your own will and yourself, you know, how can those two, how can those two flow together? And so if we know the Lord's will and we know what God wants from our lives, but we're not willing to do it, I think that applies here. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. But I don't want to cause confusion here or complicate things. God's will isn't that hard. It only becomes hard when my will gets in the way. Amen? You know, it's when my will stands in opposition to God's will. But when my will is surrendered, then God's will becomes a joy and a blessing and yields a beautiful, fruitful life. Am I surrendered to the Lord? Let's go on to James chapter 5 now and read verses 1 through 6. Can we stand together as we read these verses? And let's read them out loud together. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as if it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Amen. You may be seated. Rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Here we see it's described the rich, the sinful, oppressive, and selfish, and pleasure-crazed individual whose life is wrapped up in his riches. And he gives some strong words. He says, rich man, there's misery coming. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you. And shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. I mean, imagine. Look at those treasures. And maybe not many of us here today have invested in gold or in silver. But what are those riches? What are those treasures? He says, whatever they are that you've heaped up, they shall witness against you. They shall stand there in the day of judgment and be a witness 
against the selfish life. It not only will witness against you, but it shall eat your flesh as if it were fire. Those are strong words. You know, this is a subject that's not real popular to address. But it is amazing how much it is spoken of in the Bible. You know, and we're quick to, to counterbalance or, or, or to try to counterbalance or to balance it, you know. And say, well, is it a sin to be rich? And, you know. Well, let's let the Bible just speak for itself. Shall we? Jesus had a lot to say about this too. Getting ahead of myself just a little bit here. Why is this strong word of condemnation given to these rich men? I think verse 4 down through verse 6 gives us the answer to the question. He says, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. So we see that there is a taking advantage of the individual that is powerless to do something about that. He is in a position where he can't he can't go to the judge and and be vindicated. You know, and I'm not sure where to put all that. What is the application in our day? I'm not sure that I have the answer. But I do think of, personally, we have, we have responsibility. But I even think of us as a nation. The goods that are brought in from foreign countries, made under child labor, forced labor. And everything in our nation is geared toward more goods and lesser price. Is there blood on the hands of our nation for that? We want it cheaper. We want it better. America is a very um, high consumer nation and living very richly from Chinese imports and, and a lot of other countries, uh, some, some that, are, that are very poor. I wonder what would happen if all of the Americans had to till our gardens, our own, our own produce producing food system. When you go down south and you look in the fields, who do you see working in the fields? The Mexicans, right? And I don't want to get into a, something that is off the subject here, but I, I just wonder sometimes. The God of heaven who is just and looks down upon all these things. You know, maybe sometimes if we could really see the conditions upon which these toys were assembled in Korea, it would, it it would not say, it, it would be a, it would be a reproof to us. It would be a reproach. But what about us here this morning? What about me? 
He says, Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And just bringing it down home, are we paying the employer his fair wage, his honest fair wage? Are we making high profits? And as the owner of the company, making large sums. But our employees are struggling to feed their families and being able to buy a place to live or meet their daily needs. Thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in the land within thy gates. At his day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it. For he is poor and set of his heart upon him, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. You know, and I, I think this has many practical applications for us. Could be in not paying our bills. I, I think as children of God, as Christians, we shouldn't have a testimony that we do not pay our bills. We should have a testimony that is clear and free. It can be in biggering for the lowest price when we're purchasing something. You know, and these things speak to where we live. It speaks to my own heart. My business associates, do they know me as one who is always bartering for the last lowest dollar? Do I have an open door to witness to them of the love of Christ? Or am I ashamed after I behaved myself like that? Now, some countries, bartering is, is the way things are done. And I don't think it's wrong to ask the man, would you take an offer on this tractor, car, whatever it is? Would you take an offer? And, and he can say, well, sure, give me an offer. Or he can say, no, that, that price is firm. And when it's all said and done, can I tell that man, let me tell you about my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who changed my life. Or is my mouth stopped? Because of my unchrist likeness. Proverbs tells us that wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. But he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Just like to say a practical word of application here that we do not participate in chance winnings or lotteries or of that sort of any kind. Don't, don't participate in those things. Don't get... Don't let that lust of the heart to get something for nothing and just fill out your name here and and win and get something for nothing. The Bible says in Job 20 verse 15, He that swallowed down riches, he shall vomit them up again. God shall cast them out of his belly. And don't we see that happen? You know, even if we just take a look around us, 
People who have been given something for nothing. How is their life? Many times their lives are a testimony of heartache and ruin and debt. Because it goes right against God's principles. Is it wrong to draw interest on money at the bank? I believe Jesus talked about that. I don't, I don't believe it's wrong. From my understanding of Scripture, I believe that's a just gain. But to invest a few dollars to try to return hundreds, that's, that is not just gain. It's not right. There have been many schemes that have come down the road over the years. And some glossed over in the name of Christianity. And that's sad to see. God's people go after those things. It just shows an unsanctified lust in the heart to want to get gain. And there's some pretty sad stories. And ministries that profess Christian, whereby the government investigated and shut down because they were illegal in their operations. And it was a fraud. Be careful. Check your motives. Check your heart. When they say 100% return in a year, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. And even if it is true, you don't want that money. Because the money that you received later down the stream of things, some widow, some grandma and grandpa are finally persuaded to put their retirement life savings into this thing. And then the whole thing collapses and crashes. And there's people who lost. They lost what they rightly worked for and laid up to care for them in their old age. And it was gone. And someone else profited by that. I'm sure you know that there's a lot of those things that have taken place. But a get-rich-quick attitude comes out of the selfish carnal nature. It's not it's not the will of God. He says the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which of you kept back by fraud, crieth. But I think of just practical things here, if I may just share a few practical things here this morning. If I am in financial need and things are tight financially and you know we know what that's like and we're in a stress and in a press I believe it's right to go and ask the person whom we owe money to can you bear with me can I can I pay you so much a month I want to pay my bills you know and, and to communicate and not just let it sit and not do anything about it. But as a Christian, as a person who is who is to be in a life of integrity and uprightness before the Lord, we go and we communicate. And we say, can you, can you give me some grace? Or we go to our brother. This person says, no, I can't give you any grace. I must be paid. I've waited 90 days. You're way past due. And when we try to work something out, On the other hand, if we owe money like that and we're in a tight situation, it's not a good Christian testimony to turn around and buy some unnecessary thing. The person who you've been pleading with to have grace and mercy with you, how will he feel? 
when he sees and discovers that you've bought some unnecessary items, really with his money, and putting off paying the man to whom you owe it. You know how we handle our money is very revealing of character and maturity, Christian maturity. He says these rich men should weep and howl for the miseries that shall come upon them as they look at that gold and silver, maybe their coin collections, their whatever it may be. Someday that's going to be like a rust and it's going to eat their flesh as, as fire. He also says in verse 5, You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have lived in pleasure on the earth. It was not only how they got their wealth, it was the way they used their wealth. And it was the way they lived. They hoarded it up to themselves, heaped together treasures. And then they lived in pleasure on the earth. I'm, I'm so blessed when I see people who their financial status is such that they could live much higher, but they don't. Because they have their value system right. And they're laying up their treasures in heaven. I'm sure you heard it said this way already. That person has too much money. And what people often mean by that is, it's ruining their character. It's ruining their testimony. You have lived in pleasure on the earth. We live in a pleasure mad craze. Millions of dollars spent for more thrilling amusement park rides and all sorts of entertainment. Millions of dollars spent to produce entertainment for a pleasure made society. Misused riches will erode character. Paul warned in Timothy, This know also in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. You know, a self-centered life. And then he lists a list of sins. And at the conclusion of that list, he says, they're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. You know this whole matter of riches. The Bible speaks to quite a lot. And love of money. I'd like for us to turn over to Mark. Mark chapter 4. And just listen to the words of Jesus. In Mark chapter 4. And we'll look at a few verses here. A few scriptures in Mark. Mark chapter 4, we have the parable that Jesus gave of the sower. And then in verse 18 of Mark 4, he says, And these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. 
the deceitfulness of riches. It chokes the word. And when you think of choking, we had a weed when I was growing up on the farm that was the kind of weed that it would begin to grow at the base of a plant and it would wrap itself around the plant. And it was interesting to see in how short amount of time a corn plant that was maybe this tall and the leaves spread out nicely and growing well and this plant would begin to grow and twine itself around that plant until in a short amount of time that plant had all its leaves drawn in together or it was wrapped around it. It was, it was drawing it in and in a matter of very short time that plant began to wither and wilt and began to be pulled over because it could not, it could not break through and continue to grow normally because it was being choked. And that's the picture we have here of the riches entering in and the lust of other things and choking the word. Also, if we go over to Mark 10, let's just turn back a few chapters here in Mark 10. Some very strong words that the Lord Jesus gives to us. We'll begin in verse 23 and the backdrop here is of the rich young ruler that came running to Jesus and he says, what must I do that I might inherit eternal life? And then Jesus told him, sell what you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come, take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at that saying and he went away grieved for he had great possessions. He was a rich young man. And now, let's read verse 23 of Mark chapter 10. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Exclamation point. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looking upon them saith, With men it is impossible, but with God, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. You know, let's just let the word of God sit right there. Let's not just explain it away. This is what Jesus said. How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? You know, if, that, if those rich men could see that gold and that silver eating their flesh as it were fire, they would be quick to do something about it, I believe. Those people that were listening to Noah preach and were mocking him, if they would have had the opportunity to enter the ark after the floods began to open up out of the deep and the rain descending, do you think they went in the ark? They would have. But it was too late. The door of the ark was shut. And so it is now. God gives us a choice. He doesn't make us have to serve Him, yield our will to Him. He gives us the opportunity. He gives us a choice. Value that which is eternal. Value that which has eternal value. You know, and we can be quick to say, well, you know, um, riches can be a blessing and can be used to right. 
And I don't deny that. But I say, listen to the words of Jesus. Listen to the words in James. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But when men love God and are faithful to God and God entrusts them with the unrighteous mammon and they're faithful in it, oh, when God sees a man like that, he'll give him the true riches of heaven. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus says. So, you know, it's not like, oh, well, this money, you know, this is a terrible thing. We have to just, you know, the, the less we have of it, the more holy we are. Not necessarily. People who have very little money at times are very covetous and are very graspy trying to get more. But then there's people who have millions of dollars and they're very covetous and grasping for more. But then there's people who have learned in whatever state they are, they're with to be content and love God. And God entrusts some of those people with lots of money. And some give large sums of money. They don't hoard it to themselves. And God sees they're faithful. I can, I can entrust them. But God does allow people who hoard it to themselves to also accumulate. He doesn't reckon the books today. He doesn't balance the books today. But they will be balanced. And when they are, oh, woe to the rich man who heaped up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God, is what Jesus says. Mature, faithful men. God can use them to have a faithful business, employ people, yes, earn some monies. And there are things we need, and it's a blessing to have the things that money can buy, provided we also have the things that money cannot buy. Woe to those who have only the things that money can buy. Houses, cars, lands, all sorts of things, but empty, hurting, miserable hearts. And you know that's true. True contentment is found in dying and giving up your life. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, he shall find it. Hallelujah! But he that will save it and try to keep it to himself is going to lose it in the end. Well, I see our time is moving along. I think I'll close there. This book of James is, is very pertinent to us today. And I just encourage us that we would receive the word of the Lord. Let me just read one more verse here in closing. Out of Timothy. Good words. He says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And then we could also say again, charge them that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute. Oh, that's why God gives increase, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you, Brother Aaron. Those words. The message. Very practical, isn't it? <clears throat> right down where we live. Everyday life. Especially five days a week. Six days a week. And I think of the word contentment that he shared just towards the end there. Contentment is an attitude of the heart and is not based on your status or of riches. Are you content?
Are you content? Truly content? <clears throat> I'd like to open up for some testimonies, maybe, or uh, confessions. You get the ushers, get the mics. Encourage you to just be open as uh, brothers and sisters. We need to be open with where we are. We need to be willing to acknowledge where we are. And ask our brothers and sisters to pray for us if we're struggling in these areas. The warnings for the rich men is very strong. The warning for And I think rich men, specifically are those who are living it up, but it also speaks to all of us who have basically the power in our hands to get whatever we want. Americans, most of us, especially most of us here, we have the power with the money we have to get what we want. <clears throat> most of the world does not have that. Do we have a testimony here? Okay. Uh, I guess more of a confession. You know, I was listening to those messages and there was areas there that I could say, you know, that, uh, that applies to me. Um, I wrote down, as uh, brothers were sh- sharing, I wrote down, uh, it says, I wrote, uh, we can only know the continued will of God as we walk in the light we have. And it says, and I wrote here, that if I'm struggling to discern the will of God, it's quite possible that I'm not walking in the truth of the light he has given. And I'll have to confess that, you know, I, I see that I'm not walking in the light that he has given. And it's quite possible that in these areas of covetousness and other areas that I've even deceived myself, Self-deception is a is one of the hardest things to get to get through. But I want to give myself to the to the preaching. I want to give myself to the message because I believe it's the heart of God for my life. You know, I want to give my heart to the brotherhood. Uh, there's a verse that uh, stood out in First John. It says, if we, have, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Then uh, chapter 2, verse 4, it says, He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth His word in Him, verily is the love of God perfected, and hereby we know that we are in Him he gives us commandments. He gives us uh, direction. And as we walk in that, then God reveals more light to us, more truth. And then do we have fellowship one with another? And I can't help but think that maybe I don't have that deep koinonia and fellowship with God's people that, I, that somewhere in my heart I desire because of self-deception, because of maybe covetousness because of, you know, a lack of, you know, a true concern or, or love for what God has, you know, designed, His body, you know, the church. We were out uh, cutting up a, a pig over there, or a pig at uh, Merle's house, and I've, uh, I've had a little bit of knowledge in, in that, and, and uh, you know, we killed the pig, and you know, I began just getting into it and, you know, cutting it up and skinning it and, you know, and then, you know, having it and, and just doing my own thing. And at the end of that, near the end of all of that, you know, it struck me that these men don't have 
a knowledge of what I'm doing, wouldn't it have been better? Wouldn't it have blessed me to maybe lend a hand in helping them to maybe learn a little bit of what I, I knew? And I think that goes along with the word. Do I have the patience? Do I have the, con- the love, the willingness? Do I have the heart of God to just come alongside and just share what I have? I think that that's the true heart of a, of a disciple of the Lord and somebody who loves the commandments of God. And I can't claim that I'm there. I don't want deception in my life. I don't want to deceive myself in thinking I've attained to something. I, I feel so, so barren, you know, a lot of lethargy in my life. God bless you. May the Lord give you direction. <clears throat> Anyone else have a, a testimony or something to share here? A message, either first message or second message here? Okay, why don't we have another song, Kenny? And then we'll have a few announcements and closing. <clears throat>